All right, uh, let's get started here. Uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, designing for, for mobile is kind of the way this is framed. Uh, but to be honest, a, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about are just kind of good design practices in general uh, when it comes to building reports and dashboards. Um, but there are some kind of special considerations that are necessary when you're thinking about mobile. So um, we figured that was the appropriate way to kind of frame the conversation. Um, here's the disclaimer. I think everybody knows what that means at this point. Uh, if you haven't al already heard me talk today, I I'm Mike DeGoyce. I'm Services Director and Senior Architect here at uh, PM Square. Uh, I've been working with Cognos for uh, quite, a, quite a few years now, probably 14 or 15 years. Um, and I've been doing quite a few projects over the last several years in particular that are uh, really aimed at delivering uh, reports that can be used on both uh, on various screen types, essentially, whether it be desktop or mobile devices. So here's how we're going to uh, attack this here. Um, there's kind of four or five overall uh, agenda items. Um, first of all, we're just going to talk about kind of design in general when it comes to uh, reports, visualizations, and analytics, um, why it matters, and some kind of basic things you can do to maybe improve yours. Um, and then we want to talk about visualizations specifically, uh, choosing the right types of visualizations. Um, uh, that mean the right types, like between uh, a line chart maybe and a bar chart, and then specifically how to choose the right Cognos chart controls, because there's lots of different kinds. Uh, then we're going to talk about custom controls and CSS, um, so you can really customize exactly how your reports render. Um, we're not going to go in depth in the custom controls conversation here, or not too in depth on CSS either. Uh, the purpose here isn't to do a tutorial about how to write JavaScript or anything, but I do want to kind of like uh, open your mind or open your imagination to what can be done uh, by utilizing custom controls in CSS, especially if you didn't get a chance to uh, go to Cognos Paul's session. Um, we are going to have active reports as well. Uh, I think it's important to talk about if we are having a conversation about uh, mobile reporting because active reports were really kind of originally designed specifically for mobile devices and they still have a good bit of utility um, in that realm. And then finally, we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. OK, so uh, I'm kind of of the belief that design matters more for mobile. And there's really two reasons that come to mind uh, for me for that. Um, first of all, screen real estate is just at a premium. So if you have an ineffectively designed report and you're looking at it on a big retina screen or on a projector or what have you, you have some extra screen real estate to play with. So even if you have wasted space, you still potentially can get some important information on the screen. Uh, when you're talking about a much smaller device size, like this one, um, it becomes a real challenge. Uh, now, to be honest, not frequently designing analytics for a screen size like this. Um, my iPad is downstairs, but kind of an iPad, iPad mini is more of a common screen size uh, where you can actually get a decent amount of content on the device if it's designed effectively. Uh, but if you still don't have nearly as much, even though they seem like pretty large screens, it's still not the same as working with a computer. You're also talking about uh, touch interfaces generally, uh, rather than a mouse, which means certain elements might need to be a bit larger. So uh, it just it takes more planning. It takes more uh, design thought in order to design something effective for a mobile device. And the second is a little more abstract, perhaps. But uh, I think that expectations just tend to be higher in general when we're talking about designing for mobile devices. Uh, if you think about it, uh, how things have evolved in terms of what we view on our screens, uh, oftentimes reports that we view on our screens are kind of evolutions of uh, printed out reports, maybe, that people used to kind of just pour through the pages of it. And then it became like an Excel spreadsheet, and people just viewed it on their screens. Not a whole lot of thought put into the design most of the time in an Excel spreadsheet. It's just getting a bunch of numbers there. And then Excel started adding the ability to generate some visualizations. And you know things have kind of evolved in that manner. Um, on our mobile devices, most people started using really smart devices, uh, maybe with BlackBerry, but you know more widespread with iPhones. And of course, Apple is very well known for having a uh, particular attention to design. And so really, from the outset with smartphones, and other mobile devices, there just tended to be more thought put into the design. Apple had a lot of guidelines for their developers as far as how, the, how their um, apps had to look, uh, and they still do. 
And Google has adopted a lot of that as well with Android. And so I think just when people are going to consume some, something on a mobile device, they expect it to look a little more modern. They expect the design standards to be a little bit higher than something they're looking at on the screen. Um, they expect it to function a little more like an application is another way to say it. So for both of these reasons, I, just, I think it's very important when we're designing something that is going to be used on mobile to put more planning in, more thought up front to deliver something that your users are going to be happy with. So let's hit some, uh, let's do some quick hit design tips. Uh, first of all, uh, you might be surprised that fonts or typefaces, uh, these are basically interchangeable terms, uh, make a really big difference when you are looking at a report. If I showed you the same report uh, that was had, let's say, Arial font or, God forbid, Comic Sans uh, or some other very played out font that's been around for a very long time, and then you just replace it with a modern typeface, you'd probably be surprised at how different it looks, how much more modern uh, that that output actually looks like. Um, so what we want to do is use fonts that are not overdone. Uh, the fonts that tend to be overdone, unfortunately, are the ones that are very widespread. And in the past with Cognos, you kind of had to stick to, and not just in Cognos in general, really with web design in general, you had to stick to fonts that people generally had on their desktops. Uh, because the way that fonts were rendered in browsers, it looked to see if the font was available on your system, and it used the font that was there. And if that font wasn't there, you could specify a fallback font that it would then go to. But you really had to stick to like the 12 or 15 that were going to be on most Windows computers. Uh, or you, then you put an alternative for your Mac users. Um, and so you just didn't have a lot of good options. Uh, but the game has changed a little bit uh, with modern web design. And you now can actually embed fonts, essentially, within your reports as long as they're being consumed uh, within a browser, whether it be a browser on a mobile device or a browser on your desktop. And we're going to look at that a little bit about how it can be done. But this is just something that can modernize your reports pretty quickly if you use the right fonts. And I put judiciously on here because it doesn't mean that you just should get crazy and just be like, wow, I can use all these cool fonts now, so I'm just going to go grab a bunch of weird things. That's going to distract from the data. Uh, you know, we return to our good data visualization principles. Things should have a meaning. But just using fonts that are a little bit more modern, it's going to update the look. And it's going to um, just cause your, your output to be consumed probably in a way that your users are going to be a little more happy with it. Uh, adaptive sizing. This is another thing that you might be surprised that as soon as you implement this, your reports just have, particularly interactive dashboards, they immediately take on kind of more of a modern feel. This has been a challenge in Cognos. Cognos, if you want to uh, put a table on your report, of course, you can specify a uh, percentage size of the table. And as you adjust your browser size, your viewport size, that table will adjust. But if you want to have your font sizes adjust, if you want to have your visualizations adjust, that's something that's much more challenging. Uh, and in fact, has been essentially impossible in the past. Um, there are some ways to overcome those challenges, however, which uh, we're going to talk about here in a little bit more detail. Uh, but that's going to make a big difference. So not only does that help on the desktop, of course, where users can change the size of their browser, but then it also automatically feeds into whatever size they're looking at the device on, whatever uh, size their screen is, the report's going to automatically adjust uh, to meet that screen size. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone, uh, both different screen sizes, different window sizes people might have, as well as adapting your report for mobile devices. Another quick hit design tip, uh, copy the big boys. So what I mean by this is if you're trying to figure out how something should be designed or just trying to get a general sense of kind of where to start, uh, look at your Googles, your Facebooks, your uh, Apple.com, whoever it is that you've, if you interact with some, torp, some type of service, some type of app, and you kind of generally like the look and feel of it, and you know that a lot of other people do too because it's a widely used service, that could be a good place to start in terms of getting some ideas for how to design. Uh, let's see if I can change in an easy manner here. It's not quite as easy as I wanted, but let's try to switch over. So uh, just for example here, I'm going to go to Twitter. Just a couple things I can pick up at just from looking at Twitter here. Like if I want to differentiate between like different blocks of content, 
notably how that's notice how that's done very suddenly here with these like very thin uh, gray lines. Um, this control over here where I can input if I want to search Twitter. There's kind of a subtle gray box. It's a little rounded. There's not a border around it. Um, some of these other buttons here, you know, th there's something you can click. I see it's, you know, it's just, it's white. It's basically just designated by a border. So none of these things that we're seeing here are any kind of hard and fast rules where it's like, oh, I'm gonna design something, I must do it the way Twitter did it. But it just kind of starts to give you an idea of modern design principles. And, you know, we could go over to Google as well, and we're gonna see some similar type of concepts. We see like thin, subtle gray lines. We see, you know, these rounded boxes here. And so if you look at a few different modern kind of web apps, web design um, uh, sources, this will kind of give you some ideas to start with. And you can implement those ideas uh, into whatever you're designing. OK, let's go back to where we were. All right, your company, whether you know it or not, probably has a style guide. Um, so get a hold of it if you're going to be designing, uh, particularly an interactive dashboard, but really any kind of, any kind of report. Uh, you should be trying to implement some of those styles uh, into what you're creating if it's going to be distributed really in any substantive manner. You know, if it's for one person, maybe it's not worth it. But if you're actually going to broadcast this, make it available, operationalize something, um, try to put some of your company's uh, style into it. Style guides are going to include a lot of things. It often will include what fonts you can use. Uh, what colors you should be using, uh, even how things should be laid out, like how much white space there should be between objects. And again, you know, you're, it depends on your company a little bit. There's a good chance your marketing department isn't going to be coming after you if you don't absolutely correctly implement everything from the style guide for a report that goes out to 10 users within, inside your organization. But again, the people who put together these style guides are people who are well versed in design. That's kind of the world that they live in. It's what they eat and breathe. And so um, you can take some of that and you can very quickly kind of up your game essentially with the reports you're developing. Make it fit in with what's being developed the rest of the organization. Uh, make the content you're developing really stand out. And usually modern design is actually, has a lot of thought that's gone into it in terms of making what's important jump out, which is a big part of what we want to do uh, with our report and dashboard design. Mike, have Sir? you found that the the style guides don't work well with the mobile stuff because like they'll do it for the desktops and the, and the applications but they don't take into account mobile have you found that to be the case so so style i found the style guides that have been updated in the last uh, say five years the last few years generally have specific guidelines for mobile um but if you are working for a company that maybe hasn't Kind of take a look at that for a while. They might not have guidelines that are applicable to mobile, but they still are usually going to have things like their color scheme with specific like hex codes that you can grab and you can paste those right into Cognos to make sure you're using the exact company colors. You know, they'll have like versions of the logo. So there almost always will be things in there that you can use, but maybe some of the guidelines in terms of like spacing and such, how that all should work, might not speak specifically to mobile unless they have a, a good recent version of their style guide. Oops, let's go back to use data viz best practices. So there's a whole set of data visual, visualization best practices. Uh, I'm going to mention just a couple here in a minute. Um, but if you Google data visualization best practices, if you look up Stephen Few, uh, or there's a few other sources these days of pretty accepted best practices, uh, you'll find lots of good content uh, when, again, the, the approach that they're coming from has some thought of like what's beautiful, um, but also what's effective, and kind of merging those those two worlds together, which is really what we're after. And again, that's generally what's going into, especially designing for mobile devices, is it, it should look beautiful, it should, but also should be simple and effective. And you know, part of the data visualization best practices is have a plan for color. Um, just because your uh, organization has you know twelve different colors in their color palette doesn't mean you have to use all those uh, in the one report that you're creating. Um, just because their primary color is uh, neon pink doesn't mean that that has to be the primary color you're using in your report. Um, whatever it is, just your, your color should have a meaning. Um, that's a key aspect of data visualization. 
Uh, particularly certain colors have meaning to people, like red, for instance, green, those colors tend to have meaning. So if your uh, organization uses those colors in particular, they're part of their company color scheme, you might want to think about that. Because if you make those a core part of kind of your overall, like, let's say you have a prompt control and it's red because your company color is red, well then also if you want to highlight something in a chart as being bad, that could kind of be confusing to the brain. It doesn't make it, it's not easy to take in to immediately see, oh, red is bad. Well, no, red's the company color. So anyway, just you just gotta put some thought into that. There's not necessarily a right or wrong. Um, it's just putting some, some forethought to make sure that you have a plan for the way that you're using color. Okay, so choosing visualization types. This is just kind of uh, an illustration that I've, I've used uh, before and as part of a uh, broader presentation on data visualization, but this just gives you kind of an overview of basic types of charts. And people get overwhelmed sometimes these days, I think, because there's a multitude of, of people are creating custom infographics, and uh, every kind of analytics BI vendor to come with a new version, they're like, oh, we added six new data visualization types. And it can be kind of overwhelming, like, well, what am I supposed to actually be using? And the reality is, most of the time, you should be using probably something that's a sort of line chart or a sort of bar chart. Uh, there's some other kinds that are available. Um, certainly point and line are kind of very interrelated. But usually it's some variation on these. So you don't necessarily have to get overwhelmed by the multitude of available options that are out there. Furthermore, there's specific kind of science behind what types of visualizations you should be using for certain purposes. So for instance, um, there's different types of uh, categorization, essentially. So uh, nominal is one, and that's items that don't, that, um, I'm sorry, they belong to a common category, but they don't really relate to one another in any particular way. So in other words, you can't really put them in an in a order, uh, an inherent order. You could, of course, alphabetize them, but they don't have an inherent order. So like departments, you know, marketing isn't inherently before IT or after IT. They're just discrete items. And then there's ordinal, which are items that have an intrinsic order, but they don't represent quantitative value. So I can certainly say small, medium, large, but I don't inherently know medium equals some particular number. And then there's interval, which basically you've taken uh, quantitative data and you've converted it to a particular range of values. So you've turned it into this categorical scale. And the important thing is not to remember these labels or know what to call these things, but to know that when you see them, there's actually a particular chart type that corresponds or could be useful. So for nominal and ordinal, you really, you want to use a bar chart or some variation of a bar chart in most situations. Whereas for interval data, you actually could use a line chart or a bar chart. Uh, and the reason for this is because when you use a line, the slope of the line is actually supposed to have meaning. And if you're talking about nominal or ordinal data and you use a line, that slope essentially is meaningless. So you've kind of added what Tufty would call chart junk uh, to your report, you've, you've added something that really doesn't have any meaning that it's communicating to the person consuming it. So uh, there's a lot more guidelines that are out there, but this just kind of gives you a glimpse of, okay, I can make a decision about what's most effective, and I can implement that within the, the reporter dashboard that I'm developing. So uh, once you've made the determination about what kind of chart you might want to be using, you still have kind of this overwhelming decision in Cognos because you have a multitude of options. So, uh, you know, this is all the different types of charts, and, and that's one thing, I just kind of spoke to that. But where I think it really gets confusing in Cognos is we also have this drop down over here of just different sets of charts, which if you just were starting development in Cognos, you'd have no idea what any of this really means over here. Uh, so let me just, let's talk about this a little bit. So 11.1 .1 visualizations, obviously they're the most recent that were just introduced in version 11.1. Um, there's some really good things about these. Uh, primarily, they can actually um, size dynamically uh, to your screen or to your device uh, without any other kind of custom work to make them do so. Uh, so that's great. Uh, they're really, they're rendered client side, which is how they're able to do that. And so there's a little bit of ability to also filter these as well. And from what I understand, uh, IBM has ideas to make that, to enhance that filtering ability. So these have a lot of potential, um, but if we, let's say we put one in here, we'll get to some of this other stuff in a minute. Hopefully I didn't get signed out here. I may have. Okay, good enough. 
So you'll notice over here, this may kind of look like a lot of options that we have to customize this. The reality is there's not really that many options. <laughs> um, if, you, if you really want to get into customizing this to look a certain way, there's going to be some things you're going to be able to do over here. There's going to be other things that you're probably not going to be able to do. And you're going to get frustrated because you're going to get close to creating the chart that you wanted. And you're not going to be able to take it the last 20% of the way there. And that's really the story with a few different types of Cognos visualization. So if we go back here, 11.0, really kind of the same story. You have very similar sorts of options. And legacy visualizations here, this is kind of a mixed bag. What legacy visualizations are actually RAVE charts. I'm sure some of you are familiar with RAVE. Uh, but the idea with RAVE when it was introduced was essentially that you could create any sort of like custom chart that you wanted to. Um, but in order to do so, you have to use this uh, basically really difficult tool and essentially kind of hand code your own JSON uh, in order to come up with this. Um, and so not a lot of people have actually made use of it that I'm aware of. Um, I know a couple people who are part of our company that do it, but overall it's pretty challenging. Um, but all that to say, there's a set of these that were kind of included in the box uh, with Cognos uh, when they first introduced, introduced this technology. So they're here. You might have some other ones available that other people have installed. Um, there's, you can find some of these on the internet. But it's very much a mixed bag in terms of uh, how much customization you can do to them once you, enter, once you add them to your report. It all depends on the person who developed them. So many times you can customize almost nothing. Like you might not even be able to change the color scheme at all unless the person who developed it took a lot of extra time to setting up a lot of parameters so that you can customize aspects of these. So all I have to say, there's a place for these. I'll talk about them a little bit more later, but there's also some challenges. That brings us to charts. Charts have been in Cognos for quite a while. Um, I think they were introduced in Cognos 10. Uh, they're actually, the technical name for them is Cognos 10 ABS charts. These are the ones I almost always use. <laughs> uh, the reason being uh, is that it's definitely not because of how they look when you first drag them into the report, because they'll look terrible. They'll look like something out of Excel in like 1993, uh, which isn't ideal. But the good news is, you have almost an infinite number of ways that you can customize each one of these charts. Um, I mean, you run into a few limitations here, but you can figure out ways to make them look almost any way you want them to look. Uh, you can add padding, you can change colors of almost every element of them. Uh, you can put lines and bars and charts all in the same, uh, same object if you so desire. So uh, this is generally my go-to, unless I just need to kind of create something like quick and dirty for like a proof of concept, might use one of these. But otherwise, these are going to give you your most flexibility. The problem here is that uh, they don't, I talked about adaptive sizing. You don't get adaptive sizing with those. Um, they're just, they're a fixed size. We'll look at that in a second, um, show you what I'm talking about. Fortunately, we have some ways to work around that. But I just mentioned here the competing priorities um, is that we want to be able to customize them extensively. That's a core component of uh, using visualization su uh, successfully to meet user requirements, but then we also need them to be able to adapt to various screen sizes, and those old Cognos 10 AVS charts out of the box, they don't do that. Um, oh, one more thing I was going to mention about the RAVE, uh, RAVE charts. Uh, there's technically it was a RAVE 2 as well, um, which was just, you couldn't customize it at all. I think, I think it equates to the Cognos 11 charts uh, that are there now. But anyway, RAVE 1 are the ones that you can customize. Um, in some active report scenarios, these are very useful because it essentially um, creates, um, they're basically client-side rendered within the RAVE report. And so you can add some animation and you can decrease the, fi the file size of your active reports. So that's another additional use case for RAVE in addition to just need to create something totally custom. Okay, so uh, customized and adaptive, the combination of the two is what we're after. This visualization resizer custom control, uh, it's something that uh, we develop basically in-house. I've heard some customers talk about they've developed something similar. Um, but it's pretty powerful because it basically just allows you to take these super customizable uh, Cognos 10 ABS charts and basically use some JavaScript to resize them on the fly as the user either resizes their browser window or as they open the report on various device sizes. 
And then I just have a bull in here looking forward to what is next for my BM because I think they're going to continue to improve their 11.1 .1 charts uh, to make them more customizable and they're already resizable, render on the client side. And so for the future, I think that will probably be a route to go. Um, IBM also has talked about um, just being able to embed D3 visualizations. You technically can do it today, but I think they're going to provide some more um, kind of simple mechanisms for doing so in the near future, which will open up a whole other set of visual visualizations you can use. Um, and once that's available, we'll have more in-depth conversations about that probably next year at Bacon. So uh, before, we, before I show you uh, kind of what that can look like, uh, let's just mention a few other uses for custom controls uh, that we've done. There's kind of an infinite number of possible uses. So disabling interactivity, uh, if you've worked with Cognos reports, particularly in Cognos 11, you've probably noticed at times you kind of click something and then you like can't unclick it, it's selected, or you click one thing and all of a sudden this like whole table selected and it just kind of obscures your ability to read the numbers. So there's some good ideas behind that, that are, and it, there's some functionality where you can basically select objects and you can do some additional like filtering of objects. But sometimes for an interactive dashboard in particular, it's just, it's not useful. It just kind of gets in the way. So we've used a custom control. Uh, I think Cognos Paul actually has it on his blog uh, where you can just disable that interac interactivity entirely. And it just becomes more of like a static page. You can still have like drill through and that sort of thing, but it disables some of that stuff that gets in the way. Uh, just being able to show and hide page elements. For instance, you might have a uh, menu on the side that kind of bursts out and then collapses again. That sort of thing is particularly useful, again, on mobile devices because we need to maximize our screen real estate. So if you have prompt controls, um, you don't necessarily just want them sitting there at the top of the screen the whole time because that might take up a significant portion of your real estate. So being able to kind of show something and then collapse it when you don't need it is very useful. That can be done with a custom control. And then expand collapse hierarchical data. Um, this is a very common thing that people have wished is going to be built into Cognos for a very long time. I actually have heard that is going to be very, very soon, but as of uh, today, it is not there. So this just really means so that you can see data on the screen, you can click a little plus sign, expand it, see what's below it. Uh, you can do that with a custom control as well. All right, leveraging CSS. And we're gonna see some examples here in a minute. I'm just gonna kind of show you both of those things together rather than switching back and forth. Uh, so there's all kinds of things you can do with CSS. Um, just learning about CSS in general will be applicable to what you're doing in Cognos because Cognos essentially is rendering a web page. So pretty much anything you do in CSS, you can probably bring into Cognos. So we're not, that's, a, that's a broad area of study. We're not going into all that today, but a few things that we found effective. Um, one, using VW font sizes. These are basically relative font sizes to the size of your viewport, which is basically the size of your browser window. So as that expands or contracts, um, in addition to resizing your visualizations using uh, the custom control we talked about, you can just set these VW font sizes and your fonts will scale as well. If you want some of your fonts to scale in size and some not, you can just set some using VW font sizes, excuse me, and some of them using just regular pixel sizes. Uh, you can reference web fonts. So I mentioned at the beginning, using fonts uh, judiciously is a very effective way to modernize. Uh, you can, all you have to do really is embed uh, an, a, like a line of code in your CSS and you can then start referencing that font from within Cognos. Now it's not going to show up in your font list, but all you got to do is type in the name and uh, it'll magically show up whenever you run the report. You won't see it in report authoring view, but when you run it, it will show up there. Uh, you can set up a fixed header. So as users kind of scroll the report, maybe you want to keep some prompt controls or some um, information, general information should always be viewable, maybe row headers at the top of the screen. That's doable with CSS. Uh, you can style almost any built-in Cognos control uh, with CSS, even if it doesn't have a property available to style it, you can probably get to it with CSS. And then some slightly more advanced things, things like flex boxes and media queries. This essentially allows you to implement full responsive design in Cognos. So um, that means like as your screen size goes from a large screen, let's say this, to this, not only does everything get smaller, but maybe certain elements are shown or hidden. So maybe there's a simplified version. Maybe you have uh, on this screen size, you're showing a chart that has uh, top, 50, um, top 50 items, but on here you only want to show the top five because it's such a small screen size. You actually could render both of those items in a Cognos report, then you could use media queries so that 
certain ones are shown on certain screen sizes, and certain ones are shown on smaller screen sizes. So very powerful. Um, that's a, a little more complicated to set up, but it's all doable. Uh, some limitations of this. Uh, they're really gonna have no impact on non-HTML uh, output formats. So if you're sending stuff to Excel or PDF, um, CSS really doesn't apply there. So you just gotta think about that in your design and make sure that at least your, the core elements of your Cognos design are in place as well as the CSS. So that when someone exports to PDF, they get still a reasonable representation. Yes, sir. Just web browser. Okay, that's what, well, yeah. That's what that is. That's yeah. Part of my question. Yeah. So any web browser essentially. Uh, my next bullet here was you can have cross uh, browser compatibility considerations if you're using CSS. Now, general CSS is certainly a web standard. Um, so if you're using Firefox, Chrome, Safari, you're probably going to be okay. IE is the trouble spot frequently. Um, so if it is a requirement that users use IE. Just make sure you do testing. With CSS, a lot of the stuff is still going to be fine, um, but some things might render in a little bit funky manner, especially some of the more advanced things like flex boxes and media queries. All right, let's hit active reports before we switch over and, and look at some stuff. So there's really specific uh, use cases for active reports. Um, so you should almost definitely use active reports if users need to have their data available offline uh, in an interactive fashion. Uh, so the two things that are offline and interactive, if it doesn't have to be interactive, you maybe could just create a nice looking PDF that might do the trick or uh, an Excel uh, workbook. Uh, but if it needs to be interactive and it needs to be offline, then active report gives you both of those things. You can click through it. Um, and you can take the data with you. It's all part of this. If you're not familiar with active reports, it's basically all gets embedded into this MHT file, um, both the, both the um, design of it as well as the data behind it. Uh, you should maybe use it if you have uh, various views that you want a user to be able to easily navigate through as opposed to true custom filtering. Um, that's something that's you know, active reports work pretty well for. So even if you don't, it doesn't have to be offline, but the requirements for the dashboard it's usually for dashboards, not just like a printed sort of report. Um, but if it's just really a user wants to be able to see maybe like 40 different views of the data, active reports are a great way to accomplish that. Where active reports are less effective is if the data needs to be totally live uh, because inherently, by nature of what an active report is, you're loading the data into this file. So as soon as you generate it, that data immediately starts to become old. Um, so for certain use cases, not a problem. Maybe you have a monthly data load for like your financial statements or something. That's probably fine because for 30 days or so, that data is going to be up to date and you can just generate another one uh, for the next month. But if you're looking at more operational data that needs to be live in real time, Active Report's probably not the solution. Uh, data needs to be filtered in many different ways. Uh, if you think about it, every particular view of the data that you might want to generate has to be embedded in the single file. So if you wanted to have, for instance, five different prompts that each have 50 different values in them, and you want to be able to multi-select, you have some sort of number approaching infinity of possible combinations. There's no way that's going to go in an active report uh, because there would be so many different permutations that would have to be calculated in order for that report to be generated. And then if your data needs to be secured at a granular level, um, it's probably not going to be the right solution. Now, if you just have like 10 different views or something, that's fine. You can actually burst an active report and that could be an effective use. Um, so like just having security in play doesn't mean you can't use it. Um, you could send the appropriate version to the appropriate users. Um, but if you have maybe like multiple layers of data level security and it's some like intersection of maybe two different dimensions or something, um, at that point it gets pretty complicated and you are, you're having to generate a different version of the report for each combination. Again, so might not be the, might not be the right solution. Uh, just some other uh, active report pros and cons. The pros are it's very application feeling experience on iPads in particular. Uh, we've had some really positive feedback on a couple projects um, from some really like high level executives who just love the fact that you can like swipe back and forth on an active report, which is a common kind of design principle on uh, Apple devices and really all mobile devices these days. Um, so this works great on iPads. Um, it's usually faster to interact with than any other kind of Cognos report because it's not posting back and getting the data from anywhere. 
it's just pulling it directly from, from the file itself. Um, and then this can be kind of a shortcut to an, uh, I put in quotes, external deployment of interactive content uh, because you have everything embedded in this one file. And so if you just transfer it in some way that you're reasonably uh, uh, comfortable with, um, so maybe it's email if it's not very sensitive data, or maybe it's some other mechanism through your VPN, you can essentially get a report to someone who doesn't, isn't set up with Cognos um, connectivity, of course, subject to whatever license agreements you have with IBM. Uh, but it's a shortcut as opposed to having to set up Cognos so it has access to the web, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, the cons, uh, it's saved as an MHTML format. It's not really a standard that receives much attention these days, or as far as I know, has been revised in quite a long time. Um, and kind of combined with that, it seems unlikely that IBM at this point is gonna add any new active report functionality. Um, there's also a fairly steep learning curve to build. Uh, it's, not, it's not terrible if you've developed content in report authoring, you'll probably figure it out within the course of maybe a few days or a little bit longer to really get comfortable with it. But it is reasonably different than just developing a regular report. And then adding in customizations, like some of the things we talked about, can be either challenging or sometimes impossible, just because MHTML is this kind of format that, like I said, is a little bit dated at this point, so it's not necessarily going to comply with all the latest web standards. Uh, embedding things like JavaScript, you just your mileage may vary. It, it might be impossible to do certain things. Okay, and one final thing here um, in terms of uh, slides before we switch over. Um, I just wanted to mention kind of architecture considerations because I feel like sometimes this gets lost a little bit when people think about mobile deployment. So um, <clears throat> aside, from, aside from active reports, which is, as I just mentioned, if you want, you could email it out if you're comfortable with that. Uh, if you want users to be able to access their data outside of your corporate network, and usually on a mobile device is outside of your corporate network. Now, there are some exceptions where companies have a VPN client you can download and then you can connect to the network from your mobile device. That's frequently, if it's available, um, it's usually not something that like executives are gonna know how to do or want to have to do. And so if you're developing dashboards for executives or just other folks who aren't super technical, that could be, a bar that could be an overwhelming barrier that just keeps anyone from using what you've developed. So the alternative to that is to make Cognos available via the web. And so my intent here is not to get into all the ins and outs of that, there's a lot to it, but I just put an illustration up here. This is the basic concept, is that you're essentially moving Cognos from just being a backend server uh, into what's called the DMZ, which makes it a little more vulnerable. Uh, people, someone can actually like hit that server from the web and try to hack it. Now you're not moving your full Cognos application, you're just moving a little piece of it called the gateway out there. Um, but you're exposing some piece of it to the web. It's a potential vulnerability. So if you want to do this, uh, it's, it's not the end of the world from a Cognos configuration standpoint. There's not a whole lot to it, but you're probably going to need to involve someone from whatever the team is at your organization, network services, uh, security, penetration testing. You need to make sure that the server that's exposed to the web and the server that it connects to are very well secured, uh, have the latest patches installed, and whatever else those folks advise you to do. So um, just, you'll need a little planning for this piece. But once you do it, the benefit is that then you get kind of a public web URL where you can, whatever you set up, uh, where you can just go to it on any device and you can get to Cognos, you can log in with your security credentials and you can then access that content on your device. Okay, uh, let's switch over for a few minutes and look at a couple things in Cognos. I know we're going into the Q&A here, but I want to make sure that we at least get to look at this briefly. <clears throat> okay, so um, here's just a really dumb, simple report. This isn't, isn't going to look pretty at all, I'll warn you now. Okay, so uh, the immediate problem here that's obvious, besides just all the bad data visualization principles and gaudy, ugly text and everything, is that uh, it doesn't even fit on this screen, large screen size here, much less would it fit on a mobile device. And as I change the size of my window, it doesn't really have any effect. All I could do is see less of it. And this is, these are Cognos 10 AVS charts. So as described, they don't do any kind of resizing. 
I don't have the ability to say that they should be a certain percentage of the window size or anything like that. So here's a version uh, with a custom control applied uh, to make the visualizations resize and with some CSS applied to make the text resize. So now as I resize the window, the visualizations resize as well, but you can set a kind of a minimum width, which is why at some point uh, they're stopping to resize because otherwise they become small and difficult to read. Um, that's, that's adjustable. Um, but obviously this is immediately much more conducive to viewing on different screen sizes and different window sizes. So just for the basics, we're not going to go into how the custom control was written. That's JavaScript stuff. That's beyond my ability, even if I wanted to explain it. Uh, but really, this is just pointing to a JavaScript library that exists on a server somewhere. Uh, usually it would be on your Cognos server. In this case, I have it sitting in Dropbox. Um, you can put some exceptions here. Uh, this is just JSON, but really you don't even have to know the JSON behind it. That's what it actually looks like. But all you have to do is do a comma separated list. These are items that you don't want to be um, resized and everything else would get resized. And then you're essentially just putting this inside a block and then the magic kind of happens um, all within the custom control that's been written. Um, this text itself, I'm using a style or a class called header, header one here. And what's kind of interesting, if you see here under font, it's this uh, code which basically says Cognos doesn't understand what it is. Well, if we go up here to use Cognos Paul's bag of tricks, let's copy this to the clipboard. And if you didn't hear earlier, this is accessible from our website, Cognos's bag of, Cognos Paul's bag of tricks. I go to edit clipboard. I can now see that the font size that's been specified within this class is for VW. So Cognos doesn't have a mechanism for you to enter VWs as a font size. They have a bunch of other types of sizes besides pixels, but not this one. But I can actually, if, so if I wanted to kind of create this, this would start out as pixel, and I could, I could then change it to VW, basically, and click Finish. And then I could paste this in here, and it would create a new class, header two, and uh, then I could, could utilize that class. So uh, there's, there's other ways to do the CSS as well. Like if I go here, you can actually just include an HTML element that has a bunch of CSS in it. So you basically just start it with an open tag of style, an ending tag of slash style, and then you can put all kinds of stuff in here. The sky's the limit. But here's a couple of things that I talked about. Here's this uh, pointer. These are just Google fonts. So all I have to do is put import uh, URL and then add. These are basically multiple fonts that I'm saying I want to include. The last one here, material icons, are actually little like images or icons that essentially come through as fonts. Uh, so that can be useful as well. And then there's a lot of other stuff going on here, like I'm disabling underlying or underline from, from links. Um, I'm, what else am I doing here? Uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, here's some more advanced stuff about responsive styles uh, that I was mentioning. Uh, down below here, um, one of the limitations of the Cognos radio button control is that it always has to be vertical, one underneath the other, and it puts a box around it. Uh, you can actually use CSS to modify that. So let's run this here. And you'll see I got this super funky, ugly font here, but you can obviously tell it's not a font that would be on anyone's computer uh, generally, but it's pointing to that uh, Google font. Um, here is this Cognos prompt control. Um, this is some of that interactivity that I mentioned that you might want to disable with a custom control because it's kind of annoying that it's insisting on doing that uh, box around it. But instead of the normal Cognos version has a box around and is vertical, I've made, managed to make them side by side. Um, these images here, these are actually uh, Google font. That's that material design uh, icon thing. And if you want to know just a, a quick glimpse of kind of what it could look like to make those sorts of modifications, let me just remove the CSS here from, to remove the CSS that modifies the prompt control. Now we'll see what that renders like. So here it is, here's what it would look by default. And so if we want to figure out what CSS we need to add here, uh, the best way to do it is to go to developer tools in your web browser. Most of you have probably used this before. 
But essentially what we want to do is click this uh, inspector element here, and then we can choose elements on the page, and we can basically find out uh, how we can identify them. So usually they're going to have uh, be identified by a class, like this label right here. So now we know how to get to it within our CSS. Um, we just reference it by name here. And if we want to figure out what to do with it, like we want to figure out, for instance, how to make this deselect all, we want that to go away. Well, let's see, it's this, we see this class prompt hyperlinks container. I can then play with it over here under element style. For instance, display right now is table cell. Well, I can change that to none, and I can immediately see in real time what it does on the page. So um, this is a way to kind of figure out what your CSS should be. And then if you want, you can actually copy and paste from here, uh, or you can just go and retype it um, in your HTML element here and until you kind of incorporate everything you need to get the, the output that you're looking for. Does that generally make sense? There's a lot to it. There's a lot you can do with CSS. Um, like I said, if you just go to W3 schools or something like that and learn about CSS, you'll be able to apply pretty much all those concepts here within Cognos. All right, I know I'm slightly over time. Uh, any questions? We still have a few more minutes for questions. I'm just supposed to leave 10 minutes, so. Yes? Yeah, we have had some conversations with them about it. Um, they're, they're working on a, a new one that kind of reinvents it entirely is, is the short answer. Um, I don't know exactly what form that's going to take. I've, I've seen some concepts uh, that were that look pretty cool. Um, but the existing mobile app, I don't know if it's going to go away eventually or if it will sit side by side with the new one. Some of the feedback that I gave at the time was that the new app, it would be nice if it could still run active reports because we still see use cases where active reports are useful. Um, I don't think that's something that they had been planning, but they kind of were taking that into consideration. So I'm not sure how that will play out. But yeah, the current mobile app um, hasn't been updated in quite some time. And uh, it has some inconsistencies between Apple devices and Android devices that have fresh. It's simply a front end for showing a web page, isn't it? Is it more or less. Is it any more than that? Um, it's not a whole lot more than that. But um, there, there were some things, like on an iPad, you can actually set up uh, drill between um, different uh, active reports, uh, but only if you're doing it through the device and only if it's on an iPad, <laughs> which is frustrating because what organization has people only using Apple devices? Of course, you want to have consistent functionality across Android and Apple. So um, there's definitely a lot of limitations with active reports and with the current um, mobile um, mobile application from IBM. I think for a while that their uh, kind of stated philosophy was that they were just going to make Cognos 11 so mobile accessible they didn't need an app. Um, but I think they've kind of come around on that thinking, uh, which I, I never totally agreed with because I think there's a lot of good use cases, particularly for analytics and having an actual app, uh, particularly just being able to get alerts uh, on your device and like meaningful alerts I think is super useful. So. Hopeful that will be a part of the of the new version, but I don't, I don't have anything concrete yet. Anything else? All right. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time.